I just those are like where I would I would personally want to start. Now I I'm not a full time game designer, Wizards of the Coast, but I think that's would be closer to delivering the fantasy that I I personally would want out of this than you fix some dice and you regain a bunch of spell slots. Hello, friends. Robert Bevan here, author of the Caverns and Creatures series of comedy fantasy novels and short stories. With me is Sam West. And today we're... I don't, all I've got is going down the wizard hole some more. Um, we are, we're taking another whiz. There we go. That's a good one. That's your brand. You nailed yes. it. Yes. All right. Uh, today we're, uh, oh, speaking of taking a whiz, we're doing divination wizard. I know you're going to conceptually hate this, but this option is really cracked. <laughs> like, all right. Now, actually, you know, conceptual. I don't care much for divination spells, but I think uh, I kind of like the, uh, you know, the fortune teller archetype. And I think this does a pretty decent job with that. Sure. I think that really those two things are very much in the same lane. So you liking one and not the other confuses me fundamentally, but you know. Well, I just, I, all right. I like the stereotype or the archetype, but I, mm -hmm. I don't really care for how divination spells work in Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. 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 As a narrative well, a tool, they're great. As a character archetype, yeah. they're great. As a hey DM meta wise, how do these things happen? You're less into it. That's fair. Yes. Unfortunately uh, for you, the bulk of what's powerful here has nothing to do with those kinds of mechanics. So you should actually probably like this a bit than I would expect. Want to dive in? Um. Yeah. I, th I mean, I've looked over it and I think it's all right. I uh, I don't know that I'd play one, but uh, I don't know. I, I think I might enjoy being in a party with one. Oh yeah, I have mixed feelings and experiences with it. So you start with what all the other ones start with too that are from PHB, which is your Savant. So you get Divination Savant, uh, Savant, beginning of whenever you select the school at second level, the golden time it takes to put Divination spells in your spellbook is halved. No one's ever used these features. No one ever will. Moving on, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, Portent is the actual really busted thing you get. So at second level, when you choose this school, glimpses of the future begin to press into your awareness. When you finish a long rest, roll 2d20s and record the numbers. You can replace any attack roll, saving throw, or ability check made by you or a creature you can see with one of these foretelling rolls. You must do so before the roll, and you can replace a roll in this way only once per turn. Each foretelling can be roll can be used only once, and once you finish a long rest, you lose any unused foretelling rolls. Yeah, that's fun. I mean, if you roll high, use it on yourself or your friends. If you roll crap, use it on an enemy. Horton has a problem where it siphons a lot of the drama and a lot of the excitement out of D&D. So the really big set piece rolls now are very likely fixed numbers that you know well ahead in advance, right? What? Whether or not this monster's going to hit and drop the barbarian, well, I can just guarantee they're getting a six. And a six isn't going to hit. We know that. Or, alternatively, oh, well, the dragon's on his last leg. Let's not even bother rolling to see if we hit it, see if this encounter is over. Let's just make sure you do have a 17. It's honestly, I find kind of miserable. I don't think it's that fun to have these two aces in the hole. Basically, every roll you get will be valuable. The most valuable tend to be the ones and 20s, obviously. But, like... Even six, seven, eight, nine, like those mid rangey numbers can help right. you guarantee fail attack rolls on enemies against high AC targets. Or if you roll a 14, 13, 12, guarantee passability checks on your end, right? And that kind of power, that kind of, it, it, it fundamentally goes against the core nature of D&D, &D, which is the high variance, all or nothing kind of D20 big swings, right? If I wanted to play a game that had lower variance than this, there's no shortage of options for that. This sort of just... Again, it, it siphons away the drama of the rolls. I'm not a big fan. Well, it's only two rolls. The 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 bigger problem I see is, you know, somebody going in on all this, stacking it with lucky. Uh, what what are the the other spells and and feats and stuff that we've covered that do similar things? Like silvery barbs is a big, yes. like cascading factor with this. So is shield. You might notice this doesn't take a reaction. This is just a thing you get to do once a round, or sorry, once a yeah. turn. So, like, you can, you're going to do all the busted wizard stuff and then also have at least two guarantees for things work the way I want them to. And that is 
obnoxious, right? It It's not even like you're better at spellcasting. It's not even like you are better at using divine tools. It's not like you have a special avenue or lane that you're using with these divine tools. It's just, oh, I get to choose any two dice that I like to make whatever I want. And it kind of feels like cheating. It doesn't really like, it doesn't feel like a wizard mechanic. It's just kind of a a superpower that your character gets that's in the realm of what the EDM is supposed to be doing. And I don't, that, that really, really bugs me. It's, if you stretch your imagination, it's, it can work as divination. I don't, I don't know that it necessarily sells the fantasy, but I have foreseen he is going to miss the barbarian. And then, you know, it happens. I think more likely what happens is you have the completely average looking wizard that just picked this because it's busted and goes, <laughs> oh, we got a 12, actually. And All then right. it looks nothing like that, right? It's well, just you, a, a rules thing, right? You are not stretching your imagination. Yeah, but no, I don't think the majority of players that would take this no. archetype would. Because I think the players that want to do the fortune teller stuff, I don't know how much is actually here for them. Like, Horton is kind of it, uh, but we can keep going. I think Horton <laughs> is a device to feature. It's undeniably an unbelievably powerful feature. Uh, at 6th level, you get Expert Divination. So at 6th level, casting Divination spells come so easily to you that it expends only a fraction of your spellcasting efforts. When you cast a Divination spell of 2nd level or higher using a spell slot, you regain one expended spell slot. The slot you regain must be of a level lower than the spell you cast and can't be higher than 5th level. Okay, this feature so used to be at garbage. First, yeah, at first I thought it was, reading it you know, a little while ago. But then I thought, because I, I, you know, I, I just don't like Divination spells. But then I saw the spell you pick up doesn't have to be a divination spell, right? Uh, yeah, you just get a spell slot back. Right. So, I mean, you can bank a bunch of uh, what uh, fine traps just to use so you can regain. Uh, you know, if you've had a hard fighting day, you need some extra shields. There you go. Sure. I think so. The, the core gimmick is trying to encourage you to cast the bad divination spells, right? Like the fine traps. Like augury, like detect thoughts, those kind of stuff. And I think there is a world where in into the diviner sense, you take things like detect thoughts, then you re you use your detect thoughts to get a free use of a first level spell slot again. And you're like, okay, now I can magic missile and I'm doing the thing. More oftentimes what's going to happen though is you're going to take it on the, the power gaming sheets and you're going to take mind spike because mind spike is a very solid little damage spell. And whenever... It up it upscales, so you can cast however, at whatever slot level you'd like. You can spend a third, fourth, fifth, sixth level spell. It starts at a second. It does 3d8 psychic damage plus one per level above second, and it refunds you a lower level slot. So now, it's not even that high of a cost to have a consistent and constant damage barrage, right? If you let, Let's look at an eighth level mind spike. Let's say you go absolutely crazy for it. That eighth level mind spike spots you a seventh, sixth, fifth, fourth, third, second level mind spike. You can just go down the uh roster... Sorry, let me correct slot. you. The uh, the slot you regain must be of a level lower than the spell you cast and can't be higher than 5th level. Okay, sorry. So you go 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd, 2nd level. Down the rung, the rung from 6th level and under. Thank you for the clarification. Still, one 6th level slot equating to a 5th, 4th, 3rd, 2nd, and 1st level slot, as long as they're all mind spikes, is a pretty good deal. Especially whenever you are already loaded with every other busted spell available to you. So a lot of times what you're going to see these characters want to do is set up some big damage effects, throw out mind spikes, and have a good time just having all their powerful options on their sheet all the time. You don't mind dropping concentration on mind spike once it breaks or something more powerful if you need to. It's... That's true. It kind of turns Mind Spike into a really powerful damage cantrip. Yeah, because, again, the, the cost is very, very, very low because they feed themselves, right? Because as long as you keep casting it, you're not going to run out of resources. You get yeah. you get one spell slot equating to five spell slots worth of spells. And while they're, each one has to be lower than the other, I'll take a first, second, third, fourth, and fifth level slot over a single sixth level slot every day of the week. Now... There's the real question, how often do you need that many resources? And I do think the answer is not that often. So more likely what it's going to be is you're going to you're gonna work in some mind spikes to your core play pattern, especially whenever you drop concentration on the busted effect. But it's still like the core gimmick that it's supposed to be enhancing doesn't really... Like, I, I'm not encouraged to cast these spells because they're good or I want to use them or they're empowered or they help yeah. the fantasy. I'm encouraged to cast mind spike over and over again, right? <laughs> or, I mean, 
Yes, or the thing I said, you just cast crap just to get um, some more uh, absorb elements, some more uh, silvery barbs, some more shields. If so, if, if you're finding yourself running low, I believe at any time you can always upcast first level spells as higher levels anyway. Always just not just use your second level slots. Don't even bother casting the fine traps and cast shield. Or oh, yeah, that's still true. An option you have right. All right, so yeah, mine's less useful, but sure. um, anyway. Either one encourages you to use spells you don't necessarily want to cast, uh, which is, and, and not like, in a in an interesting way. Um, I do think there there will be a fraction of players who are who are unlike me, who just really enjoy the divination spells. They enjoy the mechanics. They enjoy the effects, and uh, you know, good for them. Well, if you look at, like, the fifth-level options, I wouldn't say any of those outside of Telepathic Bond are castable. Like, I think <laughs> most of them you don't ever want to put on a sheet, and if you do, they're ritual spells. So you can cast them without spending a spell slot already, right? I mean, Commune with Nature wasn't too bad, was it? It's also was not that, a wizard was spell. that a druid spell? Yeah, all right. Yeah. I, somebody so, like, likes scrying and legend lore. I, I'm not convinced. We got comments. I know. There will always be people that like <laughs> everything. I don't think an average player is going to find no. a lot of success employing these tools and trying to live the fantasy. This doesn't help you see the future. This doesn't help you do certain di villain's plans. It doesn't help you spy on people. It just gives you a discount, kind of, for using effects that you could do for free anyway. Right? Yeah. Like, most of these are ritual spells that would be doing the fair diviner thing. And the other option, again, just cascades down to be a bunch of free uses of 68, 5d8, 48, 3d8 damage. And then they all refund, right? Like, not a fan. Not a fan, Bob. Wish mine like one printed. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I remember in our Mind Spike video, I had to come up with stupid creative uses to make it good. But uh, in this case, you don't need to do that. Yeah, this like so literally outside of this option, it's just a bad chromatic orb. But because yeah. it's a bad chromatic orb that costs you half of a second level spell slot, like it refunds you a first with it, it becomes very appealing. And that's like the floor yeah. use of it. Getting five first level spell slots and two or sorry, getting six first level spell slots and two second level spell slots, all of a sudden you just got way more resources for having mind spike on your sheet. Now the resources are a lot more even, but you're still gonna be encouraged to do those kinds of things. And again, none of this prevents you from doing the already busted wizard stuff. You're still going to be encouraged to do all of the, the known quantities and not really given much reason to consider using scrying. You're not going to do any unique diviner things. You're going to do busted wizard stuff. That has nothing yeah. to do with divination most of the time. Except now you get one unique spell. Uh, tenth level, we get the third eye. So starting at 10th level, you can use your action to increase... <laughs> your powers of perception. When you do so, choose one of the following benefits, which last until you are incapacitated or you take a short or long rest. You can't use the feature again until you finish a short or long rest. You get dark vision out of 60 feet is one option. You can see on the ethereal plane within 60 feet of you is another option. Um, you can read any language or you can see invisible creatures within 10 feet of you. Well, this, uh, I don't, I don't think this is too bad. This is, uh, for the player that wants to play this archetype. This is, uh, yeah, not most tables, perhaps, but um, I I do like that you you get to pick and choose every short rest. You know, sometimes you're going to need to read something. Uh, sometimes you're going to want to see invisibility. Sometimes you're going to want to see ghosts. I think when in case of invisibility, most of the time when you need it, you don't know you're going to need it. It's one of the fundamental frustrations with invisibility, right? Is you don't know you're going against a visible stalker. It just happened to be in the dungeon. It's you don't know you're going against an invisible creature and you're not going to prepare a spell for it otherwise. So I don't think this necessarily solves that problem. It is kind of a reward for the foresight, though. It's kind of a reward for, let's scry the dungeon, see what's in it. Oh, now I know what their weaknesses are. I'll take sight to see those things. I could see that maybe coming to fruition. I don't have confidence D&D &D players and tables will engage in that kind of game in a way that will make this feature better than 60 foot dark vision, which I think was what the default is, right? Well, no, no, I don't know if that's true because I mean, so many characters already have dark vision from their race. Am I back? Yeah, you didn't actually leap out too much that time. 
Oh, great. Um, if you're going to finish a long rest, Bob, which of these are you defaulting to? Like, if you don't know what your encounter tomorrow is, you know you're going into a Lich's dungeon, you don't know if there's going to be ghosts, you don't know if there's going to be invisible stalkers, you don't know what's going to be in there, what are you prepping? Okay, did you hear me when I said, you know, a lot of races already have dark vision, so that's I, not... Okay. That's, okay. Sure, um, I did not hear that, but there you go. That's a, okay. a reason not to. Um, so then what? Let's see. Uh, I'm probably going... Uh, my default is probably going to be the invisibility, even if I don't have dark vision, because somebody else is bound to not have dark vision, and we'll have a, a source of light. Okay, then what happens whenever the... If you come into an invisible creature, big if. If you come into a visible creature, it's more than 10 feet away from you. <laughs> and uh, I won't see it. Yep! And this feature does st continues to do nothing, right? Yeah, but uh, if it does come within 10 feet of me, then I'm happy to know it's there. If an invisible and stalker gets within 10 feet pants. of you, you're probably about to die. Right? Like, yeah, if something invisible is on top of you, it, it's done its job. The invisibility has worked its magic, right? Yeah, but now I can target it with... Oh, wait a second, no. Because it's still invisible. Yes. Those stupid It'll still rules. have it. Yes. Oh, God. All of that is still true. Oh. Remember, we're comparing this 10th level feature to a 2nd level spell that we rate as garbage. And the I, Ethereal I, Blade I, I one is even less likely rules. to get used. Yes. I think this feature is close to unusable. I think it's pretty hot garbage. Yeah. But it's okay, because you already got one really busted feature and one feature that has the potential to be really obnoxious as far as resources go. <laughs> um, we end with Greater Portent, because Portent isn't good enough. At 14th level, the visions in your dreams intensify and paint a more accurate picture in your mind of what's to come. You roll three d20s instead of two as your 14th level feature, which is genuinely amazing, because three more fixed results is really good. Like, one extra fixed result? Yeah, don't mind if I do. That's that's still busted, and you get now better variety and better spread. Oh, I hate and... school. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wouldn't play it, but, uh, yeah, it's undoubtedly powerful. Yeah. I think that this option really boils down to Portin being obnoxiously powerful and then largely failing, I think, to save any of the problems the core dividing system has, right? I think you both, you and I do agree that while I might like Augury more than you and you might like, you know, see invisibility at one point in your life more than me, I don't think <laughs> any <learned>. of, <laughs> I don't think any of them, any of this option highlight those spells in a unique, interesting, or fun way. I don't think they give you new tools to do interesting, divining stuff. I think more often than not, this defaults to being, I'm going to play a wizard. I want to play the most powerful wizard I can. I'm going to take the busted spell list. I don't really care what the flavor of it is. I'm just going to decorate my character the way that I want to. And then you're just going to have really busted features on a really busted class. And that recipe makes this an A, but an A that I really hate, right? A, a wizard that determines the outcomes of events isn't a fun wizard for me personally to play with. Uh, yeah. I've, I've had tables where, like, a wizard has become the default center of attention for all encounters going forward because they decide of the one encounter we get for the night what one in, or two results in the round look like, or two results of the encounter look like. And that kind of sway is just hugely impactful. It ruins a lot of the tension. It ruins a lot of the encounter balance as far as trying to make things tense and interesting and, uh, you know, have scary moments where something bad could occur. It siphons all that energy out of it. On top of just being, oh, you also have the best spell list in the game. So, yeah. like, do you not have a fan, any but idea? It's undoubtedly powerful. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on what may, might make a better divination wizard feature to uh to harness some of the wanted flavor? I would. So, I would look to make a unique, interesting gimmick that allows you to do a cheaper version of a lower distance scrying. I'd love to have a feature where you can project your mind into a space as the couple uses per long rest, see through doors, see through walls, those kinds of things, right? That's an easy place to start. If not for vision, if you want to go with actual seeing the future, doing it outside of dice is very tricky. I would likely attach it to something closer to how Augury is worded and how Augury functions, because I think that is the best indic the best we've gotten as far as flavor goes for asking DM about how events can pr happen in a game that's so improvised, like as improvised as this is. I just, those are like where I would, I would personally want to start. Now I, I'm not a full-time game designer of Wizards of the Coast, but I think that's, would be closer to delivering the fantasy that I'd, I personally would want out of this than you fix some dice and you regain a bunch of spell slots. Yeah, I'm not a fan of any of that either. I, uh, 
I think I think divination in general just needs a a lot more thought put into it and perhaps a complete reworking. I would even go as far to say like maybe we know as a kind of fixed quantity that divination isn't necessarily a good fit for D&D and that it either doesn't I, work or is really oppressive, right? Yes, but I don't want to see it gone because that is an important archetype for wizards. And I, I think that can be very easily given to the DM side of things, right? The Lich isn't a playable class for a reason, right? There are different options and game archetypes out there that aren't existing. You don't get Peasant the Class because Peasant the Class doesn't really make sense in a world full of high-powered adventuring. And I think this yeah. might be the same case at the end of the day. That's a different conversation. All right. Yeah, that is. Um, see, so yeah, I guess <clears throat> gonna give this one. Let's see. Uh, yeah, because the third eye kind of blows. Gonna give this an A minus in power. Is that where you are? Yeah, sure. I don't. You believe in pluses or minuses, but All right, A I sounds don't... good to me. I believe in them. Okay. That's fine. You're All welcome right, to. Was, thank you. All right. That was the Divination Wizard. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. I know you've got some thoughts, so we'd love to hear them in the comment section below. Um, otherwise, like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.